ever seen the wonder in the glimmer of her sight as the eyes begin to open and the blindness meets the light if you have so say I see the world in
so good to be back in his sanctuary, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but I, I long, and I, I long for these times that we can come together and we can sing about how worthy our God is. In a world that seems filled with unworthy people and things and situations, we serve a God who is worthy of all of our praise. And we just wanna, we wanna worship him this morning, showing him that honor as we sing together. Son of man, stories of a savior, holiness with human hands, treasure for the traitor. as we sing together. You're my, you're my author, my maker, my ransom, my savior, my refuge, my hiding place. You're my helper, my healer, my blessed redeemer, my answer, my savior.
and all the earth. The earth will shake and tremble before him. Chains will break as heaven and earth sing. Holy is the name, holy is the name of Jesus, Jesus. So as we end our time of worship, let's just sing this together. Oh, the cross of Jesus Christ is the reason I'm alive for His blood has set me free. It will never Father, what a joy to be in worship and to sing about you, to sing to you, to open up our hearts and release our souls to you, invite you into our, our emotions. We're supposed to love the Lord, and that's, that's where our emotions get involved. Just to realize that the the cross of Jesus. It's why we, we exist. We exist for you. It's so amazing that your love is so incredible that it reaches into so many different areas of our lives, the totality of who we are, actually, that, that it's easy to think that it's all about me when really it's this amazing God who loves us by saturating us with grace and forgiveness and His power and His promises. And you say, what about 
What do you think about this gift? And we have no other option but to say, Lord, I surrender my life to you. I, I seek you with all I've got. I, I want to live with and for you at all times. And we have the best intentions, and then somehow, somewhere, some way, that sinful nature gets in the way, and sometimes we feel ashamed. Sometimes it happens so often we go numb. And then once again, you step into our lives and say, I knew you were going to blow it. That's why Jesus went to the cross. Come, follow me, receive from me, enjoy me, because I love you. And Lord, that's, that's what causes us to tremble. You know, we don't have to tremble in fear because perfect love casts out fear. You love us in such a perfect way that we can only tremble with emotion and tears and being overwhelmed saying, wow, how could you so perfect choose me so imperfect? But you do, and that is the way it is. So this morning, we, we stand in awe of you, and we thank you, Lord. You know, we're two weeks away from Resurrection Sunday, and I pray that these two weeks, we'd start to zero in spiritually. Some of us, we've been doing our 40 days of Lent, but now it's, it's showtime as, as Holy Week is approaching and, and, and the cross of Jesus Christ that took care of every problem we have with God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that empowers us to take care of all problems with one another because we're now under your Spirit's leading and influence. Uh, may we embrace these facts now and celebrate them all season and live them every day the rest of our life. Lord, I pray a blessing to move to and fro upon everyone here. Those who need healing, release the Spirit of Jesus Christ and move upon our bodies and upon our emotions and into our relationships. Lord, I want to lift up our ministry and ask that you would empower and anoint it. The children's ministries, whether it's the babies or the, the senior hires, Lord, and everybody in between, may they have a forever relationship with you, always experiencing your presence, you showing up in their lives, like you do for us. And just in case anybody's here and they're not experiencing that, how exciting to know that that's available, that you will show up if we decide to look for you. Lord, I'm asking you to, to, to oversee the construction of the building. We get excited because we see it's coming together. Would you continue to help build it, continue to bless that building, use it in such a powerful way that the community and the entire world is going to be impacted. Uh, Pastor, you're kind of overstating it there. The world? Yes, the world that out of this building will come forth disciples that will impact the world for Jesus Christ. Big request, but you're a big God, and I don't think we offer big enough prayers up to you. And whether it's that building or this building or every building that's represented in our households right now, fill them with your spirit, bless us with your presence, move through us so that we might be a blessing. Father, we come to church from different places on the spiritual journey. So we take a quiet, personal moment now to lift up our requests, lift up our praises to engage you.
Now, what an incredible moment to talk to you, the living God, in the household of God, with the family of God, with the promises of God available to us. How great thou art, Lord. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, the Son of God, God the Son, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Friends, let's stand and greet one another. Amen and amen. Well, welcome to church today. If you happen to be a guest with us on the seat back in front of you, you should find a green and white card. We'd love to have you pull it out and fill it out and place it in the offering plates as they circulate. And by the way, on, on these cards is a prayer request line. If you have a prayer request, these cards come directly to me and I pray for you. So take advantage of that if you will. Also, for those sitting in the center aisles, if you'd be so kind to pull out these friendship pads, this is our way of finding out who came to church. This is your way of finding out who you're worshiping alongside of. It's a chance to make a friend here in church, so please do that for us if you will. I have a few announcements that we want to share with you. The first is this Wednesday at 1130, we've got a senior luncheon taking place. So uh, for our snowbirds, before you... Go home if you want to get together one more time. For our regular seniors, come on in. Let's make some friendships. We're going to have a, a great time uh, sharing life together. So please do that for us. If you're interested in prayer and feel the call to be a prayer warrior, I want to remind you that prayer moves the hand of God, that you can pray things into existence. This is God's idea, by the way. Um, we've got a prayer group that meets at 7 o'clock, it's going to be meeting on, on this Tuesday, so Wednesday, <laughs> Wednesday, so it's up in the, the upper office, come and, and see the Holy Spirit rock that room, okay? We've got a Bible study for women, it's also on Wednesday, the Clash of Kingdoms, it's exciting, they, they always have these great titles, so um, come, 6.30, now check this out. You can come 6.30, get some Bible into you, go upstairs, do some praying, all right? I'm seeing how this works here. We got Resurrection Week coming up, Holy Week. We got Monday, Thursday at 7.30. We're going to have a powerful message. We got Good Friday at noon, uh, another powerful message. We got Sunrise Service, 6.30 at the lake side. If you're interested in getting up early, you know I hate it every morning that I have to get up. And I'm always so excited that I got up to see the sunrise over the lake and the experience, that, that feeling of what it must have been like when, when Jesus exited the tomb. So uh, I want to share with you, it's a great place to be on, on sunrise service. Then obviously we, we got our Easter Sunday. Bring somebody to church, okay? Let's go ahead and, and take a chance and invite somebody and see if we can influence another person's journey with the Lord, okay? I want to point out that we've got an app, and we want all of you to be on the app, to have that 
in your phone so that at all times you're able to download a sermon, to get information, to put a prayer request in, to give, to whatever is going on in the life of the church, it's on the app. And so I believe the instructions are on your bulletin. So when the sermon gets boring, pull this out and <laughs> put the app on your phone, okay? So if everybody's phone comes out, I'll know what's going on. So this is what we've got going on, all right? Well, speaking of the app, we're going to take the offering right now, which, by the way, you can give on the app. Uh, we've got three different ways for you to give. And, and I want you to understand that we're not trying to shake you down. We're inviting you to step into your relationship with God. We're inviting you to let the, the power and the, and the hands and reach and love of God move through your life. You know, he rejoices in blessing us, but what really makes him excited is when he gives to us and we turn it into blessing other people. That's when the flow just keeps coming, because he knows he can trust us to care for his agenda. And when we take care of his agenda, he makes sure to take care of our agenda, and we just live in this exciting adventure of faith. So this is what the offering plate's about. It's about God moving to you and through you. Amen. On that day, that day, surrender to the mighty cross of Jesus Christ, the earth would shake beneath the way of dark and sky. No word he spoke, his love was shown for all to see.
still got that yellow motorcycle? <laughs> no? This is only room for one yellow motorcycle. You still got that yellow motorcycle? <laughs> no? This is only room for one yellow motorcycle in this church, okay? <laughs> We've been doing a one another series, and today we're going to tackle something very difficult, forgiving one another. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You might recall if you were around on Ash Wednesday, I suggested instead of giving up the latte, maybe the 40 days of Lent could be the experience of forgiving somebody or some people. Because I figured 40 days would give you enough time to possibly hand that person over to Jesus. And so we're going to look at something kind of heavy today. And really, there's nothing as amazing as when you blew it and your spouse or your boss or your friend forgave you. Remember in that Victor Hugo novel, Les Miserables? Um, Jean Val John, he, uh, Jean Valjean, I should say, steals the priest's silver and he gets caught and the, the police bring him back to the priest because they're about to say, did he steal this? Because we're sending him away forever. And the priest says, oh, Jean Valjean, you forgot to take my, my silver candlesticks as well. And, and he was so blown away at the priest's forgiveness. It changed his life. That's what forgiveness can do. I'd like to say there's nothing more difficult than forgiving someone. You've been hurt and you decide to hand it over to the Lord and forgive that person. It really requires total self-denial to, to extend forgiveness. But I want you to hear me. You're most like God when you forgive. And really, forgiveness is one of the behaviors that characterize Christians. There aren't a lot of topics more important than this one. I seem to come back to forgiveness regularly. It's kind of like Philippians 3.1. To write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it's a safeguard. Uh, forgiveness is always a relevant topic because there's usually somebody that you have to forgive or you need forgiveness from. In fact, it's hard to go through life without forgiveness being required. A friend's parents went into business for themselves when he was a young boy, and he comments that the parents, his parents, needed grandpa's financial help to make the business happen. And so grandpa gave them a large amount of money, and, well, grandpa felt like his input should be sought out, and he should have an opinion about how this business rolls, because after all, he put in a lot of money, but the, my friend's father said, no, actually, you know, this is my business, and I'm going to make all the decisions. And so they argued about this forever until finally a rift occurred and suddenly they weren't going to grandpa's house for Christmas meals anymore. And when his dad and grandpa would see each other on the street or bump into each other at the store, they wouldn't speak to one another. And see how forgiveness or the lack of can rip a family apart. And when we're talking about forgiveness, it can be misapplied, misused, misunderstood, or missed altogether. And so I thought today we would look at some, some different angles of forgiveness to try to figure out how it works. Now, the first aspect of forgiveness I want to talk about is it's not conditional, okay? It's not, I'll forgive you if you do this or say that, okay? There was this one man, he was facing serious surgery. It was a possibility he wouldn't make it through, and so... He called his, his ex-business partner to his hospital bedside. His business partner had swindled a lot of money from him and said, listen, this might be it for me, and in order for me to go to heaven, I, I need to extend forgiveness to you, so I, I forgive you for what you did to me. However, if the surgery is successful, everything I just said is null and void. <laughs> okay? 
Whenever we attach a condition to forgiveness, it isn't forgiveness. Because forgiveness is not earned, it's not deserved. It's offered whether somebody asks for it or even wants it. Think about the way Jesus brought salvation and forgiveness to us solely based on his love. We didn't deserve it. He didn't ask for us to deserve it. You know, we never asked to be forgiven. We weren't even there when Jesus proclaimed forgiveness over us. He just offered forgiveness of our sins nonetheless. He took the initiative and forgave. And friends, this is how we're supposed to go through life. Somebody hurts us, we take the initiative and forgive. Just as God has in Christ forgiven you, you're supposed to forgive one another. Now, sometimes we can't seek forgiveness for people because maybe our abusive parents have already died. Maybe people interrupted our happy lives, did something bad and disappeared and we don't know where they are or how to forgive them. You know, some selfish individual might not be emotionally deep enough to understand the gift of forgiveness. But here's the deal. Forgiveness takes place in our hearts. It doesn't have to be face to face. It's about you and God dealing with someone. I remember one time I wanted to do the, the righteous thing and this person had hurt me and so I went to offer forgiveness and they taunted me. <laughs> like, okay, this is really hard. Um, you're making the situation worse here. Uh, yeah, some people, they don't honor the gift. But it wasn't about me and that person as much about me releasing that person to God. And sometimes the offense is deep and it takes a number of rehashings in your mind to let this happen, okay? You might have to forgive somebody, like I said, for the season of Lent, 40 days. But there comes a definitive moment in your life when you say, okay, I'm handing this person over to God. Lord, I give them to you. And whenever they come to mind, I'm not going to think about what went wrong between me and them. And whenever they come to mind, I'm going to remember that I chose to release them. It's a distinct moment that you need to have with that person and the Lord. Remember a friend of mine, her best friend stole her husband. And she uh, prayed for her best friend. And I said, how's that going? She goes, well, you know, you can't really hate somebody when you're praying for them to meet Jesus every day. That's how she released that horrible situation. But I say horrible situation. Forgiveness does not minimize the offense, pretending that it never occurred. We've been hurt, and we really can't just shrug it off if it's no, as if it's no big deal. Okay? We don't want to cheapen what forgiveness is really all about. It's not being spiritual to minimize the offense. Because when you suppress the hurt, well, we actually hurt ourselves emotionally and add unresolved issues to your life. It's better to bring them out and deal with them. You know, people will argue, well, why couldn't God just pronounce forgiveness over us instead of making Jesus die on the cross? Well, here's the deal about forgiveness. Okay, there's been an offense and somebody has to pay for it. Okay? You know, you, forgiveness isn't about somebody getting off the hook, it's about absorbing the offense and, and, and paying the cost for that offense. And for you and me, Jesus absorbed our cost and our offense. But, but let's do a reality check real quickly here. Forgiveness doesn't immediately restore trust. Okay? It doesn't mean that you put yourself back into a destructive relationship. And, and by the way, if you've hurt somebody, don't expect to immediately be restored either. You know, sometimes folks will come to me and say, you know, God forgave me. Why can't they forgive me? Well, hold on a minute. Trust is earned and it requires an extended period of time. And, and forgiveness doesn't mean it's going to go back to the way it was. No, forgiveness is the starting point allowing a new normal to take place, okay? You've been hurt, there's a problem between you, you've forgiven, there's a new normal. We used, didn't used to have that situation to deal with, but now we do, okay? And I wanna just remind you, 
It helps me to remember that everybody's broken. Everybody's going to sin, falter, fail, and struggle at some point in their life. And therefore, that's going to be them, and it's probably going to be you. All of us are in the same boat of needing and extending forgiveness. Now, forgiveness does not mean forgetting. We've all heard, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget. Okay. Well, actually, to forget is a little bit unrealistic. And forgiving is not forgetting the offense. Rather, it's choosing to no longer remember the offense to hold it against that person. Very important that you hear this. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 says, love keeps no record of wrongs. So when somebody hurts you, instead of writing it down for posterity, choose to no longer store it for future use against that person. Super important that you hear this. Because there's something better than forgiving and forgetting. It's forgiving and then watching God in the forgiveness process bring a transformation in that person and your relationship with them. And by the way, we might say, I forgive, but I'll never forget. But with God, he says, I will remember your sins no more. Wow. That's how God deals with your sins. You confess them, he says, good, let's move on together. We've got some territory to, to acquire, to traverse. He's ready to take you forward in this journey through life. And how many times are we still dragging those sins, and, and God's like, what, I, I thought we dealt with that. We forgave that. Let's go forward. Okay, I want you to hear me. It's important. The founder of the Red Cross was hurt badly by a man, and somebody brought the offense up to her, and she said, I distinctly remember forgetting that. Okay. What, a, what a way to do life. And, and this means that when we apply our spirituality, we're choosing to invest in another person's soul development, and we choose to pray for them. And this is when spiritual maturity starts to blossom in our life. It's when we don't start measuring life in terms of what's happened to me, but rather how to bridge Jesus to somebody else. And here's where it gets complicated for the Christian. We're not allowed to withhold forgiveness from others. In the Lord's Prayer, it reads, Forgive us our sins just as we have forgiven those who've sinned against us. Ooh. In fact, it gets worse. When Jesus is done giving us that prayer, he circles back to address forgiveness. He says, if you do not forgive another, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. How can you not but stagger back? Because if you're like me, there's a few people that, you know, <clears throat> I struggle to forgive. Come on, don't give me the blank stare like you're in shock. <laughs> I know you got that person too. So let's put that person forward right now, okay? That person in your life. Jesus is saying, listen, I, I require you to forgive them. Now, does that mean if we don't forgive them that God won't forgive us? No. Even when we're faithless, he remains faithful, 2 Timothy 2.13. We're sinful, broken people. Okay, with a, with a with sinful nature, we're, we're never going to be able to attain the perfection that God calls us to. But what Jesus is trying to say here is, listen, forgiveness is a core element of following me. It's not about we earn our salvation by being able to forgive. No, no, no. It's about the fact that we've been forgiven, and just as God has in Christ forgiven us, we're supposed to forgive others. This one man said to his pastor, you know, I'm a Christian, but, you know, somebody did something to me that I, I, it was so awful, I just can't forgive it. And the pastor said, you know, sometimes we, we say we can't, but what we really mean is won't. And if you can't forgive, what you're saying is that you've never really received God's forgiveness, and you're kidding yourself about being a Christian. Ouch. A little bit to the point. But that is the point. C.S. Lewis said, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. And again, it's easy to, to forgive others when you realize just how much God has forgiven you. This brings us to a parable Jesus told in Matthew 18. Two debtors 
Uh, one owes the king. He owes the king ten thousand bags of gold, two hundred thousand years of regular wages for a workman. That's how much he owes the king. In other words, Jesus is saying a gazillion dollars. All right. And, and it's an amount so large that it's absolutely unpayable. And friends, this represents the debt that we have with God. It's not possible for us to pay off our sins. So what does the master do in this parable? He wipes the loan away. He wipes away the unpayable debt. Well, the forgiven one goes out find somebody who owes him a small amount of money, roughs him up, puts him in jail. The master hears about this, and he gets angry. And, and the Lord closes the story up saying, so shall God be with you if you do not forgive one another from the heart. And, and, and here's the challenge. You know, I can say, I, I, I forgive you as if I'm done with you, but actually, it's from the heart where I stop and engage you emotionally bringing the forgiveness of Jesus Christ to you just as I received it. So I now see you not as somebody to brush off and ignore, but somebody to invest in with my prayer life and my, my spirituality. That's what it means, from the heart. And again, we've all wronged somebody. All of us need a Savior. And, you know, there's a time when Peter says to Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive? Seven times, and Jesus says, seven times 70. And then people will go, oh, 490 times. You missed the point. This is celestial arithmetic. As many times as it takes. Forgive them until the job is done, and you've handed them over to the Lord's grace and power. Our job is to forgive and let God take it from there. And here's the secret of knowing when we've forgiven somebody. It's when we start praying for them. And, and I mean the right prayer, too. I'm not saying, you know, Lord, may the IRS audit them forever. <laughs> okay. Right? I actually heard this prayer. Lord, give them hemorrhoids and put Preparation H on recall. <laughs> yeah. okay. it, it's praying for their good and that God's grace would save them. And you might say, well, you don't know what's happened to me. But Archbishop Desmond Tutu says, no one is re beyond redemption. And your prayers might be the catalyst to move the hand of God in their life that brings about the transformation. And wouldn't it be amazing if you got to heaven and it was your prayers that got your enemy into heaven? How proud of you would the Lord be? Well... Too many Christians, we, we lack the faith to forgive others. We lack the faith to, to, to extend this forgiveness. And friends, the lack of forgiveness is what drives your anger and feeds all those negative components of your personality. Okay? And Satan's going to use your lack of forgiveness. He's going to destroy your relationships. Okay? And he's going to make sure that you don't have any joy in life. Do you know somebody who has a problem forgiving? Have you noticed how they have this mummy that seems to be embalmed that they bring out all the time and say, oh, let me tell you about this situation and this person, this problem. And you know, after a while, you, you want to run from them and say, shouldn't Jesus have helped you deal with that a long time ago by now? And the answer is yes. Jesus should have helped you deal with that a long time ago by now. And really, to refuse to forgive is to basically say, all I can think about is my feelings. It's selfishness. You say, well, I don't know how to give forgiveness to this person. Well, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Okay? How do we do it? We focus on God. Romans 12 calls us to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. So instead of focusing on the hurt, focus on the healing. You know, I like to say, don't focus on the problem, but focus on the problem solver. Because friends, whatever you focus on is going to control your life. 
And that's why the Lord is inviting you to focus on him. God has forgiven all your past sins, all your present struggles. He's promised to forgive all your future sins. He's made a commitment to invest in your soul, removing all offenses between you and him, so you go forward together forever into eternity. This is what his forgiveness is all about. And therefore, choosing forgiveness, it involves weighing our need to get even against our need to move on with our lives. You know, right now in my devotions, I'm reading through the Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, and there's this story of, of David. He's running for his life because of the Absalom incident, and this guy named Shimi, he's a, he's a relative of Saul, King Saul, who David supplanted. And, and he sees David on the run, and so he comes out and he starts cursing at David and throwing rocks at David and saying, ah, you're getting what you deserve. And, and kind of an intense moment, and one of David's soldiers said, um, <clears throat> David, uh, let me go cut off his head. Why should this dead dog be allowed to live? And David says, let him alone. Let God deal with him. And it's a powerful statement. Because when we wallow in resentment, we're basically giving negativity a foothold in our heart, in our head, in our soul, and it becomes a place where we drop anchor. And guess what? You get chained to that spot, locked in a vicious cycle of hate and bitterness, never knowing the freedom that forgiveness brings to you. If you dropped anchor somewhere and, and you can't, Get out of that cycle. Guess what? It's probably a forgiveness issue. And here's the worst part. We're churning about somebody who's not even thinking about us. Okay? We're holding on to resentments that hurt us, and this person is, you know, they're enjoying their every day. Shimi, he held a grudge for 20, 30 years. It didn't help him. It didn't change what happened to him. It didn't correct the supposed wrong. In fact, God was the one who, who fired Saul from being king. He's out of connection to God because of this bitterness. And I've told you about the physical and psychological damage that unforgiveness does to our bodies. You know, if we keep picking this gap, it's never going to heal. In fact, we're going to set it up for infection to, to settle in there. And we're going to leave a scar because we just wouldn't leave it alone. And when our mind becomes a video recorder that keeps playing the same event over and over, we're basically rejecting God's call to keep no record of wrongs. And even worse, I think there's a certain enjoyment of nursing our bitterness and strategizing just how we'd like to see those people suffer and be tortured and all that hate that circulates. Sound like Spirit of God? Christianity? No. God doesn't want that. He wants you to go, oh, whew, this guy's a mess. He needs grace. Let me pray for them. Lord, help them like you've helped me. That's how it's supposed to be. You know, one man came to the preacher and he said, you know, <clears throat> we want you to marry us. But you need to know something. We've already been married to each other. He said, about 30 years ago, we got into an argument, and I got mad, and, well, we were too proud to apologize, and so we separated, and finally we decided to divorce. And we lived all these years alone, and now we see how foolish we've been, and, well, basically, bitterness robbed us of all the joys of life the past three decades, but we'd like to get married now and see if the Lord won't give us a few years of happiness before we die. You go, wow, the power of bitterness. I wonder how many people live in that marriage and never bring the forgiveness that could bring healing and wholesome and happiness to your life right now. See, bitterness over trivial things, it wreaks havoc in homes and friendships and churches. Uh, Dr. McMillan in his book, None of These Diseases, says the two greatest causes of physical problems are unresolved guilt not receiving forgiveness, and resentment, not forgiving others. 
And, and here's what happens. When animosity is expressed towards another person, certain hormones from the pituitary and adrenaline and, and, and thyroid glands are called forth. And the excess of these, these hormones is what causes diseases in your body. Ulcers, high blood pressure, hardening of the arteries, heart disease, kidney disease, diabetes, arthritis, colitis, lots of mental disturbances, all because we either didn't receive forgiveness or didn't extend forgiveness. Kind of reminds me of the man who went to the doctor and said, I need more pills for my colitis. And the doctor asked, who are you colliding with? Because it's not what you're eating, it's what's eating you. And maybe you're somebody who needs an attitude adjustment today. You know, this one cranky grandpa, he used to always yell at his grandson, and you know, it always took an afternoon nap, and so one day his grandson decided, I'm going to put Limburger cheese on his mustache while he's sleeping. Well, grandpa wakes up and starts smelling, he goes, oh, stinks in here, <laughs> okay? Goes out in the kitchen. Stinks in here, too. Steps out to get some fresh air. The whole world stinks. <laughs> no, actually, Grandpa, you're the one who stinks. Okay? And the problem was right under his nose. <laughs> yeah. It's been said that attitude, not aptitude, determines one's altitude in life. And I think this is true about our spiritual life. Attitude, not aptitude, determines one's altitude in our, our spiritual journey. And forgive this, it might not match how you're feeling on the inside, but it's a decision that you and I make to promote God's love and break the cycle of hatred. Okay? And when you don't forgive, you're putting yourself in bondage to your offender. And it is adversely affecting your closeness to God, right? Paul says, stop grieving the Holy Spirit. He makes a statement because an offense against a brother or sister in Christ is an offense against the Holy Spirit. That's why David said in response to the Bathsheba event, I have sinned against thee and thee only. You see, sin is breaking the rules and God sets the rules. You know, you and I, we broke God's rules. And that's why the curse of sin and death were our destiny. And this leads us to the, possibly the most powerful statement in all the Bible. When Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You know, over the centuries, theologians have debated who this forgiveness was extended to. Was it the Roman soldiers who put Jesus on the cross because they didn't know what they were doing? Or was it the religious leaders who had Jesus killed because... Well, Jesus was forgiving his murderers and showing us the, the power of forgiving people. Who was forgiven from the cross? Well, on Thursday nights, Pastor Neil Rhodes has been going through the last seven words Jesus uttered from the cross, and, and he says the answer is found in the Greek word that Jesus used for do. They know not what they do. You see, there's two words for do. Prosso, it's when you perform an act. It's when you do something. But the term Jesus uses is poyo, which refers to doing once and bringing forth something which has an independent existence of its own. In other words, once Adam sinned, he set in motion something he couldn't control and didn't understand the devastation that it was going to cause. And really, it was Adam's disobedience that set into motion sin that's continued so that all have sinned. And what Adam put into motion is what Jesus is addressing on the cross. In fact, Jesus set righteousness into motion, and it also has an existence of its own that will not stop and takes us all the way into eternity. Friends, you are the recipients of Jesus' words of forgiveness from the cross. Father, forgive them. This means, Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus took the condemnation. You don't have to be in bondage 
to any manifestation of sin, whether it's something you do or something that's been done to you. You've now been freed by the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. You know, this one woman testified to the transformation in her life when she accepted Jesus. She said, I'm so glad I got Jesus. I have an uncle I used to hate so much, I vowed I'd never go to his funeral. But now I'd be happy to go to it at any time. <laughs> Friends, forgiveness means you can postpone your funeral here on earth. You'll live longer. But actually... It means you're never going to die because the sin that brings death has been removed and you now have eternal life and a relationship with God and his son, Jesus Christ. And so, today, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Forgive one another, just as God has in Christ forgiven you. Got somebody to forgive? Let's work on this. Lord, thank you for this forgiveness. Thank you for loving us in the most unconditional way we could ever even conceive of. May we take this love, this forgiveness and extend it to everyone in our path, present or past. 